This is a particularly personal piece. It's a conversation we hosted in the digital campfire with the addictions expert Gabor Maté. And it's personal because it's sparked by a Substack piece that I wrote about my relationship with my mother and her recovery from addiction. The piece went out on Substack a few weeks ago. If you haven't read it, I would suggest maybe you stop this and read it. I'm going to put the link in the show notes below. It touches on many of the issues that come up with addiction. How much are we able to help versus how much must the addict help themselves? The nature of self-deception and delusion, what obligations we have to our parents, and all the other moral dilemmas we have to deal with with the topic of addiction. And the piece really seemed to strike a chord with a lot of people who've been suffering with addiction or had family members who've been suffering with addiction, which is why it felt right to share and also to host this conversation with Gabor Maté. And I'm putting this out on the channel now after I've checked in with all the people who have featured in it to just check that they are okay with their personal sharings being shared more widely. So I hope you find this useful. So yeah, welcome everybody to a really special Thursday evening session on the topic of addiction and recovery. And I guess everyone here has read the piece that I wrote um, last week uh, about kind of my, my journey with it, which is the first time I've, I've shared that publicly. So yeah, Gabor, thank you so much. I, I reached out to you. I can't think of anyone I'd rather have here. And I, I'm so privileged that we, we, I, I had your email address and when I messaged you, you were, you were available at this late notice. So thank you so much for, for being here. Well, thank you for inviting me. Mm. I think your framing of addiction as addiction is in a way, not the problem for the addict. Addiction is the solution. In a temporary sense. Yeah. In a temporary sense. It becomes a problem, but it starts mm. off as a solution. Yes. Could you, could you say more about that? Well, um, whenever I, I, I give a talk on addiction, I will give my definition of addiction. So I'll, I'll do so now. And um, an addiction is manifested in any behavior um, in which a person finds temporary pleasure or relief and therefore craves, but sustains negative consequences in the long term and cannot give it up despite those negative consequences. So that's an addiction. Craving pleasure, relief in the short term, harm in the long term to oneself and others, and inability or refusal to give it up or difficulty giving up. That's what an addiction is. Now, let's just do a <laughs> experiment here. Those of you that, based on that, well, no, by the way, notice that I said nothing about substances. So the addiction could be to drugs or alcohol or nicotine or caffeine, heroin, of course, whatever. It could also be to sex, gambling, shopping, eating, pornography, internet gaming, the internet itself, work, any human activity. The issue is not the external target, but the internal relationship. If there's pleasure, relief, and craving in the short term, harm in the long term, difficulty giving up, I don't care what the behavior is, you got an addiction. So that's my definition. So... What I'll ask is what I often do is when I give this talk, just people that who are listening on this talk, if you recognize that one time or another, you've had an addictive pattern in your life, and I don't care what it is, I'm not going to ask you. But if you had any kind of an addictive pattern in your life, just raise your hands, okay? If you recognize it in yourself. Okay, now, usually we have, <laughs> most people put their hands up and then, then there's a few liars who don't, you know, but that's how it works. Uh, so now what I'm going to ask you is not what you're addicted to, but when, or when, or for how long, I don't care, but whatever it was, what did it do for you in the short term? Now, what, um, is the chat line open? Uh, yes, the chat, the chat uh, box is open. It's on. Okay, well, what about if people, just some people wrote in. What did it do for you in a short term that you liked? What did you appreciate about your addiction? I don't mean, I know there was harm. Okay, it relieved uncomfortable emotions, somebody said. What else? Relief, again. Relief, it relieved the pain. Escape. When do people need escape? It's when they're suffering. Pain is suffering. Escapism, again. Access to happiness. 
uh, disconnect from life. Okay, good. Takes the edge off. Let's stop here because I have enough here. Mm. Take the edge off what? Take the edge off your suffering. Why would you need to escape life when life is unbearable? In other words, addictions are always an attempt to deal with pain, hence my mantra. Don't ask why the addiction, ask why the pain. And if you have to look at why the pain, you have to look at people's lives. In other words, people's traumas. And in my view, well, not just in my view, according to every reasonable piece of evidence, that trauma is usually incurred in childhood, whether people know that or not. So what I'm saying is that addictions are like, like pain relief, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Happiness, good thing or a bad thing? Connection with other people, or the, is that a good thing or a bad thing? Inner peace, stress relief, are they good or bad? They're wonderful. We all want them. That's how we, we just want to be normal human beings. So the addictive drive is really an attempt to regulate unbearable emotions, and those unbearable emotions are rooted in childhood experience. So the addiction is not the primary problem. The addiction is the attempt to solve a problem. And the source of that problem resides in people's life experience. Before we go to the breakouts, Gabor, I want to ask your thoughts on the dynamic that I noticed um, coming up again and again in, in the relationship with addiction that I wrote about is this relationship to the ego and the sense of the, the, the belief that we've got this, that we, we can cope, seems to be one of the major blocks. And I guess that's why it's at the core of the 12 step program of kind of like the first step is recognizing that we don't have yeah. control over it. Yeah. What, what, what that feels like a deeply kind of spiritual, deeply religious perspective of kind of recognizing the limita our limitations and, and giving ourselves up to a higher power. Could you, could you reflect on that? Like what, what is that dynamic? Well, the ego is not who we are. The ego is um, something that we come to identify with as being who we are. But the ego, for the most part, um, represents our coping mechanisms and our desperation to be in charge. Why do we have that desperation to be in charge? Because when we weren't, when we were very small, we suffered. So the ego is, is largely a response to suffering and it wants to be in control. And even when it's destroying you, it still wants to believe that it's in control and that you don't have a problem. So the essence of ego is denial and um, denial of its own, denial of the pain that gave rise to it. Now, of course, as any spiritual tradition, whether Eastern or Western, Southern or Northern, will tell you, we are not the little ego. We're not that little self isolated from the universe. We're actually connected and part of a much greater whole. In fact, the big whole, W-H-O-L-E, that's what we're a part of and a manifestation and a representation of. But for the ego to recognize that is to give up its own um, legitimacy and its own existence. Uh, so the ego fights that spiritual realization. So when people go through these spiritual experiences through meditation or spiritual practices, Sufi whirling or through psychedelics, Christian contemplation, um, the dark night of the soul, as St. John of the Cross puts it, you know, the ego suffers an ego death. It, it goes through this little death. But because the ego has identified itself with us, we're afraid that if the ego dies, we die. So recognizing that our, we're powerless is actually a spiritual step. Mm. It, it, it says, yeah, you know what? I get it. My little ego is just not sufficient to answer my life dilemma. And I need to appeal to a higher power. However you wish to define that. Now, the 12 step groups traditionally have identified it with the Christian der derived God uh, being, which is fine if it works for you, but it doesn't have to be that. But generally, recognizing that higher power does mean a humbling of the ego. So the ego is put in its place. I don't mean in a negative sense, but in a positive sense. 
oh yeah okay i'm not in charge <laughs> and uh if i want to um move forward i have to align with something that's beyond me which is a itself is a spiritual step whether the person experiences it or or or, or um, defines it as spiritual that's what it is so i i'd love to yeah i'd love to open this conversation up so i would like to open up the breakout rooms awesome i think we're all back so yeah i'd love to hear if um anyone feels that they want to share anything that they share that they shared or any sort of common themes that came up in their breakout rooms um yeah and let's let's begin a sort of more open conversation uh, and please please yeah use the chat as well for something if you want to share um but if you want to to raise your hand the raise hand function is probably in the um reactions tab at the bottom of your screen so Le leilani do you like to share first you're muted leilani Leilani, you're muted. Um, sorry. Okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to say I was really, first of all, David, I was really touched by your what you wrote um, and very appreciative. Um, and my own experience, just to speak to that for a moment, is that especially the most important part is that my two daughter, youngest daughters, are recovering addicts and. My youngest daughter was actually in prison for a while because of her addiction, um, as a result of her addiction. Um, and it was in prison that she received the most intensive therapy. Um, we did family therapy there. We did, uh, in the, she did individual therapy. We did group therapy. And it was in that process that she started to do her recovery and it stayed clean and sober since then. And I I don't think I would have ever said that being in prison would be a good thing to happen. And it was, to me, it was the best thing that ever happened for her and for us, because it was the path to healing that started to take place for the trauma that she experienced and that I experienced as well. So. Wow. Thank you for sharing that, Leilani. Um, yeah, it's amazing this topic. I mean, you've been part of our community for for an awfully long time. And I've never heard that story. It's amazing that this topic can bring up some real, um, yeah, we can really connect with each other from from this space. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Thank you. Mark. Hi, thanks. So, well, first of all, just to say, David. Also, I read your piece, and thank you for. That. I, I really appreciated it. Um, I suppose my my question was just touching on something that Gabor was saying beforehand we were talking about the 12 steps and particularly step one and two so the the, the powerlessness and then the, the the higher power i mean I, I have to say i i really struggle with those in particular the powerlessness idea i don't feel powerless powerless at all and i totally accept that i can't impact everything you know i'm not i know but uh to, to use a uh the vaky line you know i am an agent in the arena uh, i can do things um and similarly, you know, as regards to the higher power, um, I totally accept that there are things that are out of my control and that there's sort of society, et cetera, around it. Um, but I'm an atheist, so I don't believe in God and all of that sort of that, that sort of side of things I find difficult. And I, I but particularly step one, there's this powerlessness idea. I mean, we're not powerless, it's just not correct. So I, I'd just be interested in, 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 which is not to say that we're all powerful either. Um, Mark, are you open to a conversation about this? Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, okay. But so first of all, thank you. I, I, I get what you're saying. And of course, ultimately, we're not powerless. If we were, we might as well not do the 12 steps or do anything, right? So I agree with you. However, I'm not sure that's what the 12 step statement indicates. They're talking about the addicted state. In that addicted state, are you freely choosing to engage in your addiction whether it's a substance or behavior or you are you being driven to it by some internal dynamics which is it for you 
in yeah. that. If you're distinguishing that, between the addicted state, the moment when I do do something uh, that I kind of wish I wasn't doing, which um, yeah. for me is largely overeating. Um, yeah, in that moment, that is true. That um, you know, I'm doing something I don't want to do. That, that's that's so. And so, yeah, if we're defining it in that narrow sense, yes, yeah. that's what they're talking about. Right. Okay. I, I believe that's what they're talking about. Number one. Number two, the resistance to this idea of powerlessness itself is interesting, because here's my guess. It's not my guess. It's an educated opinion. Um, with myself or with any other addicted person I've ever met, there was a time when one was really powerless and suffering as a result of that powerlessness because things happened to one to hurt us. Yeah. Over which we had no power. So therefore the variety of powerlessness emotionally resonates with that helpless suffering state. So I, so again, that I'm powerless, that refers to the addicted state. It's not an overall true statement of what any human being, I agree with you, but yeah. it is very specific to that state. Number one, number two, the fear of acknowledging it is itself a marker of trauma is what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I, I yeah, I, I, uh, I think it's probably as fair to say that I uh, had some sort of traumatic uh, events in my past, and I kind of accept that. But if, yeah. um, and I, I think the way you framed it is a useful way of thinking about it. But then I would say we need to rephrase step one of the twelve steps to make it a bit clearer. Well, fair enough. I mean, I think there's a lot of things about the twelve steps that I'd love to reframe. In fact, in my book on addiction, I have created an appendix where I reframe the twelve steps in language that makes sense to me. And I think we can all do that for ourselves. Okay, thank you, that's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Robin Cressman. Yes, thank you. Um, our um, small breakout group was um, just so enlightening and it's uh, what's heartening to know is just how many different ways addiction touches people's lives through our own experience through our family experience and how many different shades of addiction there are, whether that's substance or behavior. And um, I, um, yeah, I'm just, I, I've, I've been in 12 step programs myself many times for many different, many different rooms. And there is something so powerful about the circle about sharing, about hearing other people's stories, about sharing your own story that is um, fortifying. But uh, one question to float to Gabor, um, as you say, you've gone through um, uh, having to work through a lot of this type of emotional entanglement with your wife. I'm curious if you and your wife enlisted an outside therapist, or if this was just internal work that you both were committed to that helped you walk through that and um or well, yeah. both, both, both actually i mean there was a time when we saw a very good family therapist um we both had therapy individually because it's all about as much as about the relationship it's also about ourselves as undifferentiated people i've done a lot of work on that i've also worked with psychedelics both as a provider but also as a participant and and then I'm married to a woman with whom we just do a lot of deep conversation, sometimes at the most difficult times. Uh, because I hate to tell you, but we always hook up with somebody exactly at the same level of trauma as we're at. So, so it's always two people at the same level of trauma in a relationship. That means that the relationship itself could be a wonderful training ground and a, 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 a ground for growth, or it can be a, a shipwreck depending on how people relate to their, to the trauma that they bring into the relationship. We've been fortunate that way. So, um, uh, yeah, that's our story. That's great, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, you're Sarian. Hi. Hi, now before you ask a question, can I ask you something? Sure. You're Sarian. <laughs> Were you named after a character in Cash 22? Yes, I was. <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that something? Yeah. Okay, thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, I was really touched by your article, David. Um, my mom was 
deep in alcoholism and has been sober for 11 years now. And she just lost her husband this past year. And I'm, it made me, I'm almost crying right now. Just really proud of her that she didn't relapse into addiction when she lost her husband and just kind of shows how much work she's done. And um, I too have had bouts, uh, long bouts of with addiction and, um, you know, did a number of years of weekly therapy, uh, somatic work, energy work, breath work, um, and then drinking ayahuasca in the jungles of Peru, I think where your daughter has worked, Gabor, at the Temple of Way of Light. Da da former daughter-in-law. Former daughter-in-law, I apologize. <laughs> um, okay. That's okay. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, just interesting, you know, when I first quit doing hard drugs in 2008, it was actually right when my father, my uh, birth father passed. And so um, if that was at least the first, you know, longer, longer bout with quitting. But what I brought up in the group, and I guess is part of the question for me was that, um, you know, it's felt to me being interested in this subject quite a bit both personally and tons of friends and, and just seeing how much suffering is in the world um, that, um, and we know kind of the statistics on what, how effective AA is, which is not super effective. And maybe it's due to those, you know, how we interpret being powerless, et cetera. But I felt like Gabor, you've been at the cutting edge of what addiction really is about. And there's a number of modalities that you can, tools that you can use to to face recovery, um, and I've mentioned some of those, but uh, it still feels to me like the vast majority of recovery treatment are not at that cutting edge level. And I guess I'm curious if you'd speak a little bit about um, how well you see these different modalities being adopted from somatic type of work and kind of trauma related work and you know ayahuasca and, and dealing with some of those things. So that's, I guess, my question. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, well, look, if you took your car to a mechanic that didn't understand how a car works, you wouldn't, wouldn't expect too many good results. And most addiction programs don't understand addiction. They see it either as a choice that somebody makes or more likely they see it as a disease of the brain that somebody inherited largely or for some reason developed. They don't get that it's all rooted in trauma. Now, if you don't deal with the trauma, you're not dealing with fundamental causes. You're dealing with effects. So addiction is an effect, it's a symptom. It also generates more symptoms, but at heart, as I was saying earlier, it's an attempted solution to the problem of human suffering, which itself is rooted in trauma. Therefore, if you don't address the trauma, you are just not gonna get anywhere. And this is where the 12 steps founder, um, they're, they're great to 12 steps. Um, as I was saying in a small group, Everybody in the world could benefit from doing the 12 steps, addicted or not. Um, imagine a world where Boris Johnson and Vladimir Putin and Joseph Biden all did the 12 steps and did moral inventory on the stuff they done to other, other people. We'd be living in a much better world. But what the uh, 12 step community by and large doesn't recognize is the traumatic nature and origin of addiction. Therefore, they can only take people so far. Now, some people they really, really works for, it could work for many more people if they were to incorporate trauma awareness into their um, into their processes. And the same thing is true. The medical profession, the average medical doctor does not get a single lecture on trauma in all their years of training. If you can believe it, they don't. So how are they to deal with then with all the physical and emotional manifestations of trauma of which addiction is one? So they're just not trained for it. It's not part of their perspective. So if you know if you don't if you don't have the eyes to see, you're not going to see, and they don't have the eyes to see. So those modalities that do incorporate some trauma awareness, like um, internal family systems, like my compassionate inquiry approach, like um, genuine ayahuasca experiences, psychedelic healing that is um, infused with a trauma perspective, like somatic experiencing of Peter Levine like um, sensory motor reprogramming, any, any number of modalities that do have trauma awareness are essential aspects of any addiction healing program. 
And when you even the word recovery itself, if you just meditate on that for a moment, the essence of trauma is disconnection from the self. That's the essence of trauma. And um, in my new book, which is called The Myth of Normal, out in September, um, I talk about that in great detail. So the essence of trauma is disconnection from the self. When we talk about recovery, what does the word recovery mean? It means to find something that you've lost. So you cover it. When you talk to people in recovery, what have you found? They'll say, I found myself. And so it's that search for the self, the full self, both in the physical, emotional, and spiritual sense. That's the essence of recovery. And unless the addiction programs incorporate how that self was lost in the first place, which is trauma, they're naturally going to be inadequate. They're just going to manage behaviors, but not. But they're not dealing with the primary dynamic. Thank you. Just follow up. There, it feels. I mean, I'm kind of in a bubble of of people who do the type of work you're talking about, and it feels like it's growing. Maybe not exponentially, but it's growing quite a bit. But do you? I mean, I guess I'm. The question I'm really trying to get at is: Do you see that? like 5% of the recovery quote unquote world is kind of moving in your direction? Are we anywhere close to that? Is it, is it expanding in a way that, that you see that we're, we're going to be better off or are we? I, I don't know. I, I don't know how to quantify that. What I can tell you is that trauma awareness in society is growing. There's this book here called what happened to you by Dr. Bruce Perry written with Oprah all about not what's wrong with you, but what happened to you all about childhood trauma and its manifestations. Um, there are my books, uh, you know, published in 30 languages. The new one, which is out in the fall, has already been bought in 21 languages around the world. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk's wonderful text or wonderful public book on trauma, The Body Keeps the Score, um, international and New York Times number one bestseller for years upon years now. This indicates a sea change in society's awareness of trauma, that sea change has not penetrated the official institutions, like the medical faculties and the academic institutions so much, and certainly not government uh, um, policy, but it is changing. Uh, people are coming more on board, whether it's 5% or 7.5%, I, I don't have the means to quantify it. What I do, what I can say is there's an encouraging awareness uh, on the part of more and more people. And in the face of a lot of official resistance. Oh, I was interested in that topic as well, Gabor, because it does feel like there has been a big shift in the conversation or there's a growing shift in the direction of your work and your understanding. I think the book that came out by Johan Hari was yeah. sort of very much along those similar lines. It does feel to me like the conversation is is moving in that direction. And I wonder where you feel yeah whether you're seeing the same thing from your perspective well it so happens that i was speaking to Johan just this morning on an, in another event um well as i say I, I, the indications are that you know it's changing the public interest is changing on a part of a significant minority i think it's going to take a long time i think it's going to take a long time but it's very encouraging how far it's come in the last 10 years yeah i want to say Thank you to everybody. Beautiful sharings from everyone. Um, and I'd like to say a special thank you to, to Carl. Carl, just before this, Carl is a friend of mine who I'm going for a beer with after this. Carl, do you want to say something and you'll pop to the front of everyone's, everyone's screen? You're going to have to unmute yourself. Are we allowed to go for a beer after that? I'm not sure if that's the that's the done thing, David. <laughs> just just the just the one. Just the one. Um, so yeah, because I thank you, Carl. Because just before this, Carl Carl is a good fr Carl is a very close friend who said, "Oh, I want to be there for you," and that was really touching. Thank you, Carl, and thank you for being there for me over the last years. Thank you for for sharing it for me, Dave. You've been a wonderful friend and you know you're you're you've made your journey something of use 
to other people. And I think that's a real gift to be able to do. Um, you're a good man. Yeah, yeah. And I want to yeah acknowledge the support that I've had as well that has been invaluable in the journey with my mother and and everything kind of that's unfolded over the last years, which has been an insane amount to handle, but has actually been the most incredible transformational process as well in my growth. So yeah, thank you, Carl, and other friends for being there. Um, Genevieve, who's here somewhere as well, who my ex-housemate. And there, <laughs> there she is. You know, unmute yourself, Genevieve. In my, in my old kitchen. Oh gosh, yeah. I'm in 99, back in the yeah. old world. Yeah, that's the house I lived in for 12 years that we turned <laughs> into a pop-up restaurant and all sorts. Um, <laughs> and yeah, and so many, and also thank you to so many of the previous members like Adriana and Nick coming back for, for this session. And I really feel the, the emotional resonance of this topic. And um, yeah, I really feel the the value of opening up these spaces and I would love to do more of this, this sort of really heartful, heartful space. Uh, and yeah, most of all, Gabor, thank you so much for, for being here. Thank you so much for all of the amazing work and the dedication that you have to, that I can see and the dedication you have to others and helping others. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. If I may mention, those of you that are in London or near it, on June the 13th, I'll be in a public event on how we can transform trauma into wisdom. And um, yeah. I, I don't have the website here, but you can look at my website or find it. It'll be the evening of, of June the 13th. I'll, uh, I'll in, in London somewhere. Yeah, I'll send that. I'll make sure I send that out to our mailing list, Gabor. I'll send out a special yeah. um, message to our mailing list. So mm -hmm. if, you, if you just get in touch with me on email, I'll make sure that we share it. And then I'll be back again in October when the book actually comes out and uh, there'll be some public events. So listen, Wait, thank um, you. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to work with you, uh, David, and uh, mm -hmm. all of you that shared so openly. It's always an honor to, to connect with real human beings. Mm. Thank you, Gabor. And as we, as we traditionally do at the end of these calls, if everyone would like to unmute themselves, we'll just say thank you and goodbye until next time. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.